Texas Algebra 2, lesson 116. Look, I tried to write 115, but we are farther than that, you guys. We are winding down this book quickly, and today's topic is a fun one. It is not heavy on calculation. It is not super complex. It's kind of fun. We're going to talk about, um, I would say these into the general topic of probability and there are fun easy calculations and they're usually about games of chance or uh, similarly everyday situations and it's super practical. I also saw a wedding a movie about this. So this, um, this. It was about a wedding. It was called um, Love Wedding Repeat I saw it on Netflix this weekend. What was it rated? I am not sure it was rated R. Um, it had a lot of similarities, but not much else in it. Anyway, I'm thinking whether it would be appropriate for you guys. Well, you know, maybe. You could look into it. Like I said, it was Netflix. Um, the movie was so-so, but I loved the premise because it was based on. The idea was that um, a woman was English, her husband was Italian, the wedding was happening in Italy, Italy, Italian, um, and there was one table with all of the English guests at it, so there's a picture of the table, and I think there were eight of them, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay, and so what happened was the bride friend and, and another man and woman that kind of had a thing and they were tr they were hoping to like take it to the next level and so this bride set the table up with all those factors in mind um, and she strategized to make sure that it worked out so that the right people were sitting by each other but then little kids were playing in the reception space before the guests got there and they very innocently mixed up the name tag and so they had people sitting by each other that you know wasn't ideal and the idea was how many different arrangements there are how many different ways there are to seat people around the table and how that can impact the way it plays out so what happened was that the kids messed it up and then we saw that scenario play out and realized it was a disaster all these fights and arguments were breaking out and all these misunderstandings because the wrong people were sitting together. And then we did a time rewind and went back and saw, okay, what if the, the seating had been arranged differently and the right people were sitting together? And at first it looked, and then we played that scenario out, and at first it looked like that was going to be bad, but then guess what? It all worked out really fine. So that's a really fun example of what we're going to talk about when we sit in circles and figure out how many different possibilities there are. That's a slightly more complicated um, version. So we're not going to start with anything like that. We're going to start simpler. And we're going to say how many different ways can the numbers 3, 5, 7, and 8 be arranged in order if no repetition is permitted? Okay, so I want you to imagine that we have four wooden blocks, like little kids play with, you know, little alphabet blocks, only they have the numbers on one side, that's what we're looking at. And we have a tray that the blocks fit perfectly into that looks like this. So we're looking down into this box, you can imagine it kind of like this, right? It's three-dimensional, right? And then this is the front of it, and we're going to arrange the blocks so they fit here face up looking at us, okay? So, the four blocks are over here, or that can be up here, right? Each of these numbers is in a block. And we're going to put the blocks into the, the tray and see how many different arrangements that we make. When we start out, how many choices do we have of blocks? So we could put four, right? We could put any one of those four into the, the first space. Now, once we put one of the blocks in there, let's say we put the seven in, oh look, you can see the paint on my thumbnail, I painted all the things. 
We put one of the blocks in here. It doesn't matter which one. I'm talking about the study. Now how many blocks do we have left to choose? We have three blocks left to choose from. Now how many blocks do we have for this next phase? Well, there's only two, right? And then eventually we get down to just one. So this is how many choices we have for a block to go in there. Answer, we multiply 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and that will tell us how many different arrangements. Um, let's see, 4 times 6 is 24. So there are 24 ways that these four blocks can be arranged in here. There's no repetition, right? We can't make the number 3333 three, three, three because we only have one wooden block that is 3. Okay, that's the first example. One thing I like about these problems is they're neat. Everyone has its own little personality, and we don't really have a formula that we always use. We have to kind of think each one through. Okay, how many four-letter signs can be made from the letters in the word equal? Okay, wait a minute. The letters in the word equal, there are five of them, but it says how many four-letter signs. So even though we have five letters, have four spaces that we're trying to build up, so that's kind of different. And last time we said no repetition, this time we're saying repetition is okay. So this time imagine that these are like Scrabble letters. If you've ever played Scrabble with the physical game, you know that you get a bunch of E's, there's two Q's, there's more than one tile of each letter. So this time, we're going to pretend that. It's not just one block. We have an unlimited supply. So, we want to know how many different signs we can make. So we go to the first letter, the first blank we're going to fill in in our tray. How many choices do we have for this first option? Well, we could put in any of those five letters. So there are five different options. Second block. Second yeah, space in our tray. How many can we put in there? Well, we've got an unlimited number of tiles. So even though we only have one in the first one, we still have five to choose from. It's not like when we're not allowed repetition where you use up the block. This one, we have all five tiles available to us at all times. So our answer is going to have more possibilities, isn't it? Because we could have all four E's, all four Q's, all four U's and on and on and on, right? So, this is what this calculation looks like. It becomes 25 times 25, which equals 625 ways. Wow. That's a lot more ways, isn't it? So when we're allowed to repeat the elements, we're gonna have a lot more options. Okay. Like this next problem, it reminds me of my college exam. Example 116.3. There are lots of examples in this, but as you can see, they're short and quick and to the point. Um, we've got a multiple choice quiz, and it has eight questions. Within each question, there are four possible answers. That makes sense, right? You can imagine it's like, Item 1, A, B, C, D. Item 2, A, B, C, D. That's how multiple choice questions tests work, right? So, we need to figure out how many different permutations which, grammatically, it's a little bit different, but it's how many ways, how many different versions of the test can we make given eight questions and four answers. Okay, so let's draw a picture. We always draw pictures with these kinds of problems because it helps us wrap our head around what's going on. Okay, so this is the test. There are eight questions. There are eight decisions we have to make, right? When we get to problem A, how many options do we have for answering that question? Four, because there's four answers for each one of the questions. So, problem two, A, B, C, D. 
problem three, A, B, C, D. You can see we're going to have four options for each of the eight questions on the test. Make sense? So, when we, so that's the way we, we create our picture, right? Problem one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, they all have A, B, C, D underneath them. So that means we calculate four to the eighth power, right? Which equals the big number 65, 536. This, my friends, is why teachers know when there's cheating, if two students turn in the exact same set of answers, because it's not very likely, even with a small test that only has eight questions, there's so many different ways you could combine them that if two students, excuse me, I'm yawning. If two students come up with the very same set of answers, that is cause for concern because it's not very likely that it would happen by accident. 116.4, how many three-letter signs can be made from the letters in the word numeral? Okay, so John's just picking random words to give us sets of letters. N-U-M-E-R-A-L is how you spell numeral. We're only making three-letter signs, so we're not going to need to use all of those at once. We're going to have a lot of options. And can we repeat the letters or can we not repeat the letters? No repetition, says John. And that's always given to us. There's no way we can figure that out. It's John telling us. Sometimes the problem itself explains it to us. Like for we understand that if there's four answers, four multiple choice answers to every question, there's going to be four every time. We don't need to be told that repetition is allowed. Okay. So, how many options do we have for letters to put into the first space? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We could put any of those in. These are the wooden blocks, though. They're not. They're not the. Uh, they're not the Scrabble tiles. We don't have to be told the lack of options. There's no repetition allowed. So now we've taken one of our options out of the equation in the first blank. So now we have six left. And then when we go to put in our third letter, we're only going to have five left to choose from. But that's still quite a few. And then we do 7 times 6 times 5 equals 210. I multiply that as 30. Mm -hmm. When you get up into the really big calculations, or you know, these really more complex ones, um, I'm okay. I'd rather you did it by hand. But a lot of these are easier than you think. So work at them. Don't just grab your calculator. That's what the fat kid on the couch does. You guys don't know that story, but I'll tell it to you another day. 116.5. Jamie has five places to put items on her display. She has 38 different items. How many arrangements are possible? Um, okay. She has five places in her display. And she has 38 items. Okay, that could be displayed. Um, I will tell you that I taught this lesson to the Smith girls at their house. You've probably been to their house. If not, I will tell you that we always sat in their dining room. And opposite me, I have to draw a picture of this. Okay, I always sat here. My student always sat here. Here there was a window with a windowsill. And here there was a china cabinet full of stuff. So this is the way I always explained it. Let's say that we put tape down and divide your windowsill into five different cubbies. And then let's say there are exactly 38 items in your china cabinet. So what we're doing is we're taking things out of the china cabinet and creating displays on the windowsill, five items at a time. I would want to know how many different ways we can display those 38 things that are in your china cabinet on the windowsill. Okay, so this is going to be a big number. This is one where I'd allow you to use your calculator. Here's a close-up of the windowsill. There's 38 items in the china cabinet, so we have 38 options for the first space. Now, this problem doesn't tell us if we have repetition or not, but we can assume that there 
are repeats that 38 represents the total number of things. So we are saying by inference that there's no repetition. If we pull out repetition, if we pull out a gravy boat, there aren't magically more gravy boats appearing behind it. The gravy boat is one of the 38. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, so now when we go to put the next item out, there's only 37 and then 36 and then 35 and then 34, right? So when we multiply those numbers through to 33, I'm copying the answer. I multiply those five numbers together. That is how many different ways we can arrange the items from the Smith's China cupboard into the display on their windowsill. Now, sadly, we can no longer do this because the Smith's China cupboard was broken down, decluttered, all the items, a bunch of items, and the China cabinet itself sold before they moved to Texas. So I'm sorry, their Texas dining room can't help us, but this was their Evans dining room. Okay, good. This whole idea, the way that we're doing this, is technically called fundamental counting principle. I don't like to tell you that title ahead of time because it's so long and hard sounding. Principle. I don't even like to put that idea in your head, but that's what this process is called. All right? That's what we did first. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about probability. It's a long lesson, but I think a fairly fun lesson. Probability. All right, this is games of chance. We've dabbled in them before. Hopefully you guys have too. Um, it is where there are a number of outcomes possible that have an equal chance of happening. It's really games that create these kinds of outcomes for us. Real life doesn't have um, such an equal chance of things occurring, but it's things like rolling a dice or flipping a coin. And the probability of any event example, flipping a coin and getting heads or tails. It's a fraction where we put the number of desired outcomes over the number of total outcomes. Okay, so in this example, in the example of flipping a coin, there are two outcomes. You're either going to get heads or you're going to get tails, right? There's no, it's not going to land on the edge. You're not going to get anything but heads or tails, all right? And in this particular scenario that we've devised, we want heads. The desired outcome is heads. So you can see it would be one to two, right? One outcome over two outcomes. So the probability of getting heads, we say, is one half. I would write this down here, but I don't have it. Okay, so, Let's challenge ourselves and make it a little bit harder. Um, oh, let's do flipping a dice or rolling a dice too, because that's going to come up in the problem. Before I get into the problem, um, remember that a die, a die is the singular of dice. It's not a word that we use very often. It has six sides. And the options are getting rolling a one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? If you're just doing a single one. But what, example 16, six access, asks us, what if we're rolling two dice? What is the probability of getting a sum of seven? And what's the probability of getting a sum of greater than eight? Okay, now we can visualize in our heads one through six, right? Look, here's a one, here's a two. I just feel clue happening as I do this. 
Okay, that's probably my most often played board game. All right, and then four, five, and six are on the side, so we can't see. But what if we're rolling two dice? Then what we need to do in order to really visualize this is we need to create all the different outcomes that are possible. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so this is the first die and all the different outcomes that are happening. And this is the second die, all the different outcomes that are happening. When you play a lot of board games, as you guys know, you add them together, right? So that's what our chart's going to do. If we roll a one and a one, what move do we get to take? A two. You add them together, right? A one and a two give us a three, and so on. Right? What if we roll a two and a one? Okay, we already figured that out over here. It's a three. A two and a two gives us four jumps. Two and a three is five. We just add these together, right? And we just keep on going until we fill in our chart. Here we're getting down to the good moves that have lots of jumps in them. Oops, seven. Okay, so those are all the different outcomes we can get when we're playing a game with two dice. Now, the question is, what's the probability of rolling a seven? Okay, so we're going to use this. The number of desired outcomes, okay, that's just one. We're looking for a seven, right? How many sevens? Oh, wait, that's not true. Look at all the different ways we can get a seven. One, two, three, four, five, six different ways. Six different outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, six different outcomes will give us a move of seven out of how many outcomes in all. If you count these all up, you'll find there are 36 different outcomes you can get because it's six times six. So the probability of rolling a seven is six outcomes out of 36, which we can also reduce to one over six. That's the right answer. What about a probability of rolling greater than an eight? Okay, we want the really high scores, right? So we're gonna count any score that is higher than eight. So we'll start with the nines. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there are ten rolls that we can get that are greater than eight, and that's out of the total of 36. And so we can reduce that to five out of 18. Divide both numbers by two. Okay? So if we're rolling, rolling two dice, we in any of these probability things, we want to make a map of our possible outcomes, if it's not super easy to imagine in our heads. But when we have two die, oh, excuse me, that requires us to envision all the outcomes this way. All right, independent events. told you this back at the beginning that these little scenarios we're imagining are based on outcomes that are equally likely to happen. So for example, when we're rolling a dice, when we're rolling a pair of dice, one for, that was me shaking the Yahtzee cube, um, any of those numbers are equally likely to come up one through six on each die, two through 12 for a total, flipping a coin, heads is as likely as tails. And this often can be a little bit mind blowing. Think about this. Let's say we're flipping a coin, you and I, and we're going back and forth, taking turns. And the first 10 times that we flip it, flip it, we get heads. 10 times in a row we get heads. Now that's really weird, isn't it? That's kind of strange because we would expect, if we flipped it 10 times, we would expect five of those times 
to be heads and five to be tails, right? Because they're equally likely. But flipping a coin is an independent event. Every time we flip it, it's just one out of two, one out of two, one out of two. And so even if we've gone 10 times in a row and gotten heads every time, that doesn't change the odds of the next flip. That doesn't mean we're more likely to get heads on the 11th toss. It doesn't mean we're more likely to get tails. Every single time we flip the coin, it's one out of two that we'll get heads. So it doesn't matter how many times in a row we've done something, it doesn't change the probability of each independent event, which leads us into example 116.7. We flipped a coin a fair coin, what John is saying when he says a fair coin is it's not weighted or altered in any way to make it more likely to land on heads or tails. It's tossed three times. So here's the first toss, the second toss, and the third toss. What is the probability that it comes up heads every time? Okay, well, we just talked about this. It's one out of two every single time. It doesn't matter what happened hot minute ago. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in a minute. Each time we flip the coin, it's one out of two that we're going to get heads. So if we want to know how many times we'll get heads three times in a row, we multiply the events together. And we find out that we have a one in eight chance of getting heads three times in a row. Okay, multiplication. One more example and we're done with this lesson. It was long, wasn't it? But it, it's kind of fun and it's kind of easy. A fair coin is tossed four times. So one, two, three, four, and it comes up heads every time. Okay. Now here comes the question. What is the probability it will come up heads on the next toss Okay, so the question is, the fact that it came up heads all these times, does that have any effect on the fifth time? And the answer is that 1 through 4 have no effect on toss number 5. So the probability of heads on event number 5 is 1 out of 2. Does that make sense? It's kind of a trick question. I mean, not really. It's a problem that's designed to underscore your understanding about independent events, that what happened on the last event has no effect on this event. Okay, that's lesson 116. La, 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 la. 117 is also a dream. I'll see you over there in a minute. Or, you know, not.